yeah, people people need to act. People need to protect what they have, right? It's your paradise here, right in front of your doorstep. So do everything to protect it. I can see from the work that we're doing here today that we're definitely making an impact. Like last year when I came here for the first time, the first thing I felt after doing it, even though it was a hot day and I was super tired, I felt like my time was definitely worth it. These are the voices of volunteers on Mount Lavinia Beach in Sri Lanka. It's a beautiful beach along the west coast of the island, next to the capital city of Colombo. It's one of the most popular places to swim in Sri Lanka and a particularly good place to watch the sunset, I've heard. What these volunteers are cleaning the beach from may surprise you. Plastic nurdles. They're lentil-sized microplastics and you've probably never heard of them. They can cross oceans, poison wildlife, are an absolute nightmare to clean up. It also happens to have a deceptively adorable name. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> so in this episode of Our Broken Planet, we're following the journey of these nurdles as they cross continents finding out what happens when they're unleashed into our environment and meeting some of the activists with exciting ideas about how we can fix it. From the Natural History Museum, this is Our Broken Planet, where we find out how we created some of the problems in our modern world and search for solutions from nature and science. I'm Khalil Thurlaway. And I'm Tori Herridge. Across this series, we'll be exploring the interconnected issues facing our Earth and asking the question, what can we do about it? And in this episode of Our Broken Planet, we're unwrapping the plastic nightmare that is nerdles. <laughs> do not be fooled by their cutesy name. Once they get into the environment, nerdles are hugely damaging, so it's no surprise campaigners and governments alike want them to be officially categorised as dangerous to transport, just like fuels or explosives. The exponential rise of plastic over the last hundred years is a problem that we've all heard a lot about. But don't worry, we're not going to preach to you about why you should stop using plastic cups. You already know that. Yeah, hopefully. Anyway. Um, so anyway, Khalil, nerdles, fill me in. Well, they're kind of where plastic products come from. They're little granules of plastic, no bigger than about five millimetres, and they're made from common plastics like polyethylene and polypropylene, which in turn are made from fossil fuel raw materials like crude oil, natural gas and coal. Uh, they actually look they're like little beads. Yeah, little kind of beads of different colours. Um, and they're melted down and turned into pretty much any plastic product that you can imagine. So if like your plastic Barbie doll could ask you where she came from, okay, yeah. like, want a deep-seated insight into her origin story. <laughs> Basically, Barbie, this is where you came from. You are nerdles. When I was no more than a nerdle in my father's eye. <laughs> but the less funny part of it is that billions of nerdles end up in the sea every year. About 230,000 tonnes you know, they get into our environment pretty easily because they're small, they easily get blown out of containers and washed down drains and they flow along rivers and currents and they just, they get everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the things that are made of plastic, right? So they'll float, like little tiny things floating off there. But of course, they're just one part of what is a much bigger problem of microplastic pollution. Plastic's a big problem full stop, right? So 230,000 tonnes is a big number, but that's still only a small proportion of the entirety of the problematic plastic that makes it into the ocean. And that is why um, last year, 175 nations at the UN agreed to try and develop a legally binding agreement on plastic pollution and to have that ready by the end of 2024. They've just had second round of negotiations in Paris, there's another round in the autumn in Nairobi, fingers crossed. Oh, no breath. But now let's look at one of the worst nurdle spills in history. When it first came, I remember I got a call and saying, hey, guess what, there's a ship in our waters and uh, it seems to be having some sort of problem and nobody really knew what was going on. That's the voice of Mudita Katuovala. He's the coordinator and founder of the Pearl Protectors, a youth-led volunteer organization which focuses on marine conservation in Sri Lanka. On the 20th of May, 2021, a container ship known as the Express Pearl caught fire off the northwest coast of Sri Lanka. 
those two days it was kind of silent because it was said that oh everything is under control there's nothing to worry about it's just a minor incident it would burn for 12 days pouring toxic chemicals like nitric acid and methanol into the sea and of course nurdles my interest towards the ocean stems from younger age i loved swimming i started swimming when i was probably four years old i live in an island which has these beautiful beaches you know you can always warm waters tropical waters it's it's something that really is a point of bliss by the time the express pearl came into sri lankan waters mudita had been running the pearl protectors for three years They'd done a few social media campaigns to raise awareness about plastic pollution on the island, and one year they'd even made a Christmas tree from littered plastic bottles. Mudita had some experience of dealing with the aftermath of a shipping disaster before. A few years earlier, an oil tanker carrying 300,000 metric tons of fuel had caught fire off the east coast of Sri Lanka. But as the debris from the Express Pearl started washing up, it was obvious that this time something was different. I remember first June, started seeing pictures of nurdles and no one in Sri Lanka knew what nurdles was. This was during a lockdown in Sri Lanka. That was a problem because we couldn't even go out to really assess the situation. But I remember seeing on newspapers and on media, like how people from these coastal areas used to go and collect all these bags filled up with nurdles and just carry it home. It was everywhere. It was just washing up on beaches. It was literally like snow. You go to the beach, it was like seven feet tall nurdles. The sea was white and uh, every wave that uh, came about, it was just like layers of nurdles just washing up again and again and again. You know, you hear that and you sort of think, wow, that's, you know, that sounds bad, but how bad can it be, right? It's just a beach covered in plastic. But the UN says that the sinking of the Express Pearl was Sri Lanka's worst ever maritime disaster. Like, remember they'd had an oil spill like, a few years earlier, but this was the worst ever maritime disaster and it was also the largest plastic spill in history. Right, the government responded by banning fishing in some of the worst affected areas, which was to protect people from you know the, the, the impacts of plastic in their food, but it had a massive impact on the livelihoods and incomes of a lot of people you know, in these coastal communities who live off the sea. The nurdles and the other chemicals that were leaked from the ship also poisoned fish and other marine life in the area. And, you know, we've got an image here that you can have a look at, Tori. It's someone holding open the, the gills of a, of a dead fish on the beach. And inside the gills of this fish, you can see big, you know, five millimeter plastic beads. That's the equivalent of finding plastic beads in your lungs. Mm, well, well, people do, we'll come to that later, people do find microplastics in, in human lungs. So, uh, you know, um, but these are you know, clearly, like, you know, the way that you know, the gills work is the water flows over them and mm -hmm. the water's full of nurdles, right? So it's going to get stuck to the gills, presumably it's in their stomachs. These things get trapped inside and it, it, the fish is dead, either from the chemicals from the same spill or maybe as a direct result of that, who knows. But it's, you know, once something enters the ocean, it can travel a long way, particularly if it's light and it can float. And the UN actually estimates the majority of the nurdles from that spill remain at sea. And that's mad to think about because the beach was feet yes. deep in this plastic. Yes, and that's not and even And that all sounds of it. like a, an insane gargantuan amount. And the fact that most of it is still out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's just like, whoa, how much can there be? A lot. 230,000 tonnes. Yeah, it's a lot of nurdles. Nurdles, like the ones leaked from the Express Pearl, can end up places like the tiny and beautiful Lord Howe Island. The Natural History Museum's very own Dr Alex Bond has been researching the impact microplastic is having on the bird population there. Lord Howe Island is probably one of my favourite places on the planet. It's uh, about a two-hour flight east of Sydney, Australia. It's in the middle of the Tasman Sea. And it's basically the bits of land sticking up from an old, otherwise uh, dormant volcano. It's a small island. There's 350 people that live there. It's got two fantastic, massive 
peaks down at the south end and is one of the seabird literally meccas. And for us, it's the biggest colony of flesh-footed shearwaters in the world. The flesh-footed shearwater is a medium-sized seabird. They're a chocolatey brown, big chunky seabird. Uh, kind of like a seagull, only sort of point your wings. They've got a tube on the top of their nose and that's what all shearwaters have and that helps them smell. They've got a great sense of smell. They've got a, a light beak with a dark tip and pale colored legs. They weigh about 750 to 900 grams. And when the adults come down and they start courting, they make the most fantastic sound, which, which sounds like they're shouting, pick me. Like, pick me, pick me. Alex is speaking about the shearwaters with a ton of love. But what he and his team of researchers have been doing on Lord Howe Island is anything but romantic. It's an early start for us, about six in the morning, um, which is just about sunrise. Uh, and the first thing we do is we go and walk along beaches to look for birds that tried to fledge, chicks that tried to fledge or leave the nest for the first time overnight and then didn't make it. So they get washed back in. We look for beach birds in the morning, bring them back to the research station, and then we begin the process of necropsying them, so, you know, dissecting them. We look at plastics in particular, so we, you know, take plastics out of their stomach. They get counted and enumerated and weighed and classified. We take tissue samples to try and understand the effects of plastics. And depending on how many birds we have, that can take 10 minutes, or we've literally been in the lab until five or six o'clock in the evening. We have dinner, and then we go out into the colony when these chicks are emerging for the first time. They breed in burrows that are three meters deep in the sand. And they come out at night, about seven o'clock, to you know, stretch their wings and you know, some of them to, to make that first flight. And then we catch those birds, uh, and we can actually look at the plastics in those live birds by using a technique called lavage, which is basically just stomach pumping. So we introduce some, uh, some salt water, sea water into their stomach. They cough it back up into a bucket and anything that's lodged in their stomach comes with it. Normally things like squid beaks or fisheye lenses, but also plastics. Through this process, Alex and his team have found all sorts of plastics in the stomachs of the flesh-footed shearwaters. Our old enemy, nurdles, but also bigger bits of plastic, bottle tops, fish hooks, aerosol cans, and over 15 years of studying these birds, they've discovered that ingesting plastic is causing them to develop a disease, one that they've termed plasticosis. You know, you think about, you know, you've got all this plastic in the bird's stomach, it's sitting in there for 90 days. And stomachs are these fantastic organs because they basically have all these little folds in them, which basically serves to increase the surface area of the stomach so that all the gastric juices can absorb, you know, and the stomach wall can absorb all the fantastic nutrients that birds should normally be eating. But when you get plastics in there, what happens is you get uh, an inflammatory response, which means you get the loss of these uh, rugae, they're called, these sort of, you know, waves and undulations. It basically looks like a sheet of, like, shiny wax paper or something. You know, there are no folds in it at all. And you get increase in water content, and ultimately, at the cellular level, you see scarring, like the development of scar tissue. And, you know, the more plastic the birds had, the more severe this condition was. In severely impacted birds, when you're holding a bird, you can sort of hold it between your two hands, um, sort of around its, its wings and around the stomach, just below the rib cage. You can feel the crunching. You can hear the crunching. Is plasticosis actually killing the birds? Alex says it's hard to draw the line between whether the bird died because it ingested plastic or another reason, like malnutrition because the stomach was so full of plastic that the bird's not eating. Either way, is whether plastic is lethal even the right question to be asking? So traditionally, people want to look at you know, what impact does plastic have? They instantly think of population level impacts. So, you know, is it causing a species to decline or individual level mortality? This bird died because of plastic ingestion. And if somebody walks up to you and says, how are you today? 
and your only two options are alive and dead. You know, that doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. So, you know, we know that there's all sorts of things that, you know, drawing from our own experiences, we can be sick, we can be injured, but we can still be alive. And wildlife is no different. So we wanted to, you know, really understand what was happening with the birds, because when you spend so much of your time in the field cutting open, like literally making birds vomit bottle caps, you know, you intuitively know that that's not a good thing. You know, we can sit here and argue until the end of time about, you know, the, the severity or the degree to which plastic ingestion is bad. But the one thing we can all agree on right now is that it doesn't do any good. Wow. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but hearing Alex talk about being able to feel and hear the crunch of little bits of plastic from the outside of a bird. Yeah, baby bird. Like, like if you can just, like, I could almost feel it in my hand right now. Right. Like, kind of like that kind of sort of like, like a kind of gritty, crunchy. Oh, that's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Luckily, we've spared our listeners actually hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> The idea of swallowing bits of plastic is pretty disgusting. Now, we might not be mistaking nurdles for caviar, but unfortunately, we are ingesting other types of even smaller microplastics all of the time. While we're in bed asleep, we are probably breathing them in. So a lot of people will have carpet at home. A lot of people will have polyester sheets or the filler inside their duvets is plastic. So uh, when you're moving around and you're shuffling in your sleep, you're probably releasing some and you will probably inhale some of those. Once you get up, you're brushing your teeth. Most toothbrushes are, are still made with plastics. Some toothpastes still have plastics inside them. And then once you're starting to eat, so you know you have your cereal, you open your plastic bag that the cereal comes in, you pour that on, you open your plastic bottle that the milk comes in and you pour that on. They're pretty much everywhere. Dr. Faye Cuthero is the head of the Microplastic Research Group at the University of Portsmouth. She's an expert in pollution and in plastic that is really small. Like really, really small. We're talking about, you know the rubber at the end of your pencil? That's about five millimetres. So something that's smaller than that, all the way down to something that is one hundredth the width of a human hair. Not just what's in the water, but what's in the water, the air, the soil. That did actually kind of stop me a bit, actually, in my tracks. Yeah, we hear so much about microplastics in the water, I would say, more than anything else, actually. Um, but the air thing... <laughs> I'm a little concerned that still the prevalence is for people to think, it's OK, I'm not impacted by microplastics, I don't eat fish. I have heard that, somebody has said that to me, and I said, I think you probably are. What is the actual issue with breathing in, drinking, ingesting microplastics, what are the impacts on human health? Predominantly the work has been done on animal health because they've been looking in the environment. So I must say that the human health is at the early stages. But uh, if it's been seen to cause problems in other species, the likelihood is once we hit a threshold, we will start to see some of those problems. Uh, so in different species, there have been things such as uh, it has changed hormone balances in them. So endocrine disruption is, is one of the things. There's been a physical blockaging of their intestines and things for the particularly smaller species. Uh, and there's, of course, respiratory distress. I, mean, ba I think it would be basically impossible to live in the modern world without interacting with plastic at every single point in your daily life. I can't see that you could do it. Everything has plastic in it, almost to the point of insanity at the moment. You know, things that really don't need to be plastic are often plastic because it's cheaper. So there's this real shift in mentality we need to make if we're going to make a difference here. It's not about demonising plastic and it's not about saying people shouldn't use plastic, particularly in areas where there is no other material that could do the job. But there are uh, many, many areas where particularly single-use plastics and things like clothing, things where there are alternatives. So what can we do about the microplastic situation? In reality, the majority of plastic is out there because it's breaking down from the larger plastic. So we just need to try to reduce our plastic usage. As you, we've said before, it's an amazing product. We, we're not going to get rid of it. And there are 
uh, places like hospitals where it is absolutely essential in terms of keeping things sterile. We're not going to get rid of it there. But in the places where there are alternatives, we need to start looking at those alternatives if they have an end of life usage, you know, or, or, or there, there is a plan for their end of life as opposed to plastic where there is currently no plan. It's also important to recognise the differences between Alex's research and, and Faye's work. Faye's really important work on the human health side of microplastics and this kind of level of plastic that Alex is seeing in the birds are a wildly really different, different yeah. in scale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as yet, people aren't finding you know, children's stomachs so full of plastic they can't eat food, right? And Faye is very clear. She doesn't want to terrify people. She says she doesn't want to scare people. She just wants people to be aware that it, you know, that if you see what happens to birds and also various lab experiments, then there is an indication that you know, plastic does have a health effect. And those health effects that Faye is looking at are still really serious from relatively, you know, comparatively small amounts of plastic. Um, some of these birds that Alex is, you know, measuring the plastic in, they're ingesting up to 10% of their body mass in plastic. <laughs> so, you know, a, an 80 kilo person is going to have eight kilos of plastic sitting in their stomach if, in that analogy. Yeah, yeah, that's a hideous thought, isn't it? It's about thresholds, right? And the problem, though, with thresholds, right, let's say there is a significantly high threshold for um, detriment to human health for various plastic levels, right? But there's also the issue of what you think of as the precautionary principle. Uh, how long will it take for us to find out what that threshold is? And do we want to wait until we see that effect, which might take a generation to yeah, observe it, when we've already then baked in a problem for many generations down the line. So she's like, okay, we don't know what the problems are exactly, but we do have all of these, all of these insights that it could be a problem. And that's just for human health. Did your conversation with Faye make you reconsider some wardrobe items? <laughs> I'm only wearing cotton today. <laughs> <laughs> only cotton <laughs> at the moment. What about you? I think I'm mostly but I mean I'm wearing trainers so yeah. there's always a certain amount of plastic in there yeah I mean I have to say actually I look went through my wardrobe afterwards and most of my clothes is like <laughs> natural fibers because I'm a bit of a, like a cotton and wool kind of person but you know I just find it's it's that kind of fact that it's you know, plastic is so embedded in our lives that and I think so much of the kind of anti-plastic initiative is focused on individual behavioral change which is important it's really important but it sometimes feels like this problem like it's a distraction from the massive overarching bigger issue that is um, a poorly managed plastic production use end of life pipeline that yeah that that is that story it's like you know it's it's that's the big issue no matter how you know, if I, even if I only ever wear I didn't know, cotton and silk and wool for the rest of my life. And if I never, ever, ever, ever um, get a you know, plastic water bottle or something like that, if I don't, you know, don't buy single-use water bottles, I feel like that is just um, a drop in the ocean compared to like... No pun intended. No pun intended. A nerdle in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but now, speaking of nerdles, what steps can we take to stop them from being spilled? I've got some in a jar here, you can hear them rolling around. And these have all been collected from the beach. And the reason that they've got from the beach is because they've escaped from the plastic supply chain. Heather McFarlane works for FIDRA, a Scottish environmental charity working to reduce plastic waste. The good thing about this form of pollution, if there's ever a good thing about pollution, is that it can be stopped. So this is a preventable form of microplastic pollution and it can be stopped by really simple measures. Vidra have helped organise the Great Nerdle Hunt, an annual event which encourages people all over the world to head down to their local beaches, canals and rivers to look for nerdles and report them online. But they're keen to emphasise that the solution to this problem has to start at the source. So it could be training staff, to stop nerdles being spilt. It could be putting filters in those drains. It could be tweaking your equipment. It could be using more sturdy packaging. Say they're on a ship, for example, stowing them safely. We have big shipping containers going past here all the time. You'll see them stacked really high with containers. 
And if there's nurdles on the top and there's high winds, those are some of the first to go over. But if they were stored, for example, below deck, then even if there was a storm and um, a few containers went overboard, hopefully the nurdles would be safely stowed. So there's things like this, that knowing where nurdles are, storing them safely, transporting them safely, that can really help stop nurdles getting into the environment in the first place. Feedra are in conversation with the industry about these simple measures. But, as Heather told us, the key is legislation that can be implemented across the entire plastic supply chain. In different countries, in different states, there's going to need to be legislation as well as potentially global agreements. When you talk about the entire plastic supply chain, that's global. And so you need a global agreement, which is what is happening in Paris, well, has just happened in Paris and will go on to be discussed in Nairobi, uh, the UN Plastics Treaty. Yeah, um, although like with a lot of international you know, conversations towards positive change, hopefully, uh, there's been a bit of a delay. There's been a bit, disagreement over procedure. But that's part Isn't of that our This is why you have these meetings, right? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're there to, to get everyone in the room and to have like really like tedious all night sessions over the, the wording of documents. That doesn't depress me. Like, yeah, it's, it's only the second round. There's still another go at it, right? And there's a massive coalition of countries that are like on board. I mean, the UK is one of them. Like, like, they, call, they call themselves, I like it, like, they call themselves the hacks, a like, high ambition coalition. And you know, one of the big goals that they're aiming for is a set of global standards for reusability of plastic. Did you know only nine percent of plastic at the moment gets recycled? Like a tiny amount, you know, right? Because it's so hard to recycle plastic. You, you, you just need to have that like, one wrong ingredient, and it becomes completely unrecyclable. That's part of the problem. And so, if there are global standards saying that manufacturers have to design their packaging, for example, to be reusable recyclable if it can't be reused, then that can start solving the problem from the, the beginning of the chain rather than getting everyone to wash out their, you know, food packaging and shampoo bottles and hope that they go in the right box. Yeah, so if it's not set up to make it easy for people to go reusable and like to enter the circular economy, then it's a losing battle. Right. And there are other approaches that scientists are trying to develop, like, you know, bioplastics that can degrade in the environment, plastic eating bacteria that could, you know, maybe get rid of some of this existing waste, or even um, I've heard that people are working on a, an edible wax spray that can be used to coat fruit and veg to reduce food waste. But, you know, it, it, it's harmless to eat, it's harmless to the environment, and it, and it breaks down eventually. Yeah, and you might even notice, like, you know, these things are already kind of happening in some supermarkets, right? Yeah, there, there are changes afoot. I, I, you can get ice sold in compostable bags. I, you increasingly see things like potatoes in, like, cardboard boxes or even, like, you know, sort of, like, heavy-duty brown paper bags, which, you know, feels deliciously, you know, kind of, like, artisan. Quint. Artisan, because <laughs> it's, like, the olden days, but it's the future. Um, but, yeah, and then, you know, if you, if you want to use a plastic bag, you have to pay for it, and it's kind of like the walk of shame. <laughs> it's like, oh, you didn't bring your bag, and that's probably, like, a powerful message, right? You know, it is. It's really important because how we regulate our own behaviour depends on what other people think of us. Yeah, it's, it's shifting that kind of mm -hmm. Overton window of what is normal. I, I definitely... I definitely feel the kind of judginess at the self-checkout machine uh, when it says, oh, did you bring your own bag? <laughs> would you really like another one? How many would you like, you <laughs> filthy animal? Yeah, it's true. But, I mean, but, but saying that, plastic is still part of the, the basic fabric of our society because it's a really great material, right? It's not about getting rid of plastic entirely. But that still means that we have to think about what we do with, uh, you know, transporting nurdles, for example, or dealing properly with plastic waste. Like yeah, getting that end-to-end -end system in place for doing these things in a way that stop them being the problem that they are right now. Uh, you know, think of plastics from beginning to the end of life and have a plan, a well-managed plan for how to deal with it. Um, you know, that's a big thing to do and it's in the works. But right now, that shouldn't stop us from doing something. Here's the Natural History Museum's Alex Bond again. So the thing is, there's no quick fix. And so I think, what can you do? Is a really big question. I think there's three things. The first is to look at the plastic that you have in your own life and think about, if you can, what plastic alternatives there are. Because ultimately, market pressures 
eventually work. The second one is a lot of the pressure has to come from the top. Plastic, once it gets into the ocean, will literally travel the world. The oceans are all connected. And so to really solve the plastics problem requires a global solution. And so that can only come from governments working together. And the third thing is sort of, you know, the environment around ourselves. You can go to your local park, your local beach, your woodland, and I would wager that within five minutes, you can find some plastic. And this is all plastic that, for whatever reason, has escaped the waste stream. And the more plastic we can return to the waste stream, and the more leaks in that waste stream that we can plug, the better. And what about Mudita and the pearl protectors in Sri Lanka? In the wake of the Express Pearl disaster, they assembled an army of volunteers who came together to clean up their home. We knew we had to do something. By 1st of July, we had the Nurdle Free Lanka campaign. I can't even believe how fast we had to plan it out. We even built some of the sieving tools that was needed to clean the nurdles and we had to find funds. Luckily, a lot of people started seeing the problem and that kind of kick started the whole process. And soon after the COVID restrictions were relaxed and then people were allowed to go out. Instantly, we started calling people in, come on, let's go to the beaches, we'll start cleaning. And we were cleaning so much of nurdles. I remember 300 kilograms in one go microplastic and at the same time uh, we we had to like talk to restaurants and to see how we can set up nurdle portals so that anybody who wants to clean at any given time can use the tools that we make every week we were out there in the beaches because we knew as much as we can remove from the beach that means they will not go back to the sea and then everybody who came to volunteer they had a really good time every time we did nurdle cleanup everybody was like in a mad rush to come and help out. It was a it was a good vibe. So you feeling inspired to go down the beach and sieve some sand? <laughs> It's like sieving, that sieving the sand does seem like it's like a proper allegory of like the magnitude of the task ahead, right? And you one time you're like, oh, I'm so depressed at that thought, but then you see they're smiling, they're smiling in that picture, they're also, having fun. Also, importantly, <laughs> they, as in plural. Yes. So you know, this seems like a, a completely insurmountable task for one person, but together, it's something that people, if they organise and collectivise, people can make a difference you know, to their local environment. And you see this with uh, organisations in the UK, like Surfers Against Sewage mm -hmm. and things like that. But the benefit of the environment aside, just coming together with people to make your home better is like always generally an uplifting experience, right? Building community is always, always a good thing. But I love going to the park and doing litter picks with my kids. It's really fun. And they have proper fights over who gets to the picker up or a jig. It's really, <laughs> really good. I totally recommend it. And not only does that sort of thing, you know, bring people together, but that communal spirit and, and that motivation can then also be applied when you are trying to kind of advocate upwards into power, like whether it's your local government or national or, you know, international bodies like the UN. You know, it can be very difficult to to make space in one's own life, but if we can agitate for system change, then we can make sure that there is space in everyone's life to, yeah. to, to live in that kind of less disposable way. And I know we said right at the top that we weren't going to preach to people about cutting back <laughs> on plastic. Ha -ha, fooled ya. <laughs> but yeah, psych. Um, we really do need to say where you can, please try and avoid single-use plastics. Think about the life cycle of those products you're using. Like, yeah. you know, bag a salad from the supermarket. Does it need to be a bag? Or you could take a leaf out of my mom's book. Um, she used to always embarrass me as a teenager. When we would go to the supermarket, she would drag me along and she would always bring with her all the plastic packaging from her previous shop. And she would start the shopping trip by going <laughs> straight to customer service and just dumping it all on the floor. <laughs> And just walk off and continue with her shopping. What a woman. And like, at the time, I was absolutely mortified. I was like, Mom, you're making a scene. But now I've got all the respect in the world yeah, for that. I have, yeah, and of course, you're nothing like her at all. 
<laughs> Learn from the best. <laughs> but uh, you know, we don't all have to make as grand a gesture as that. But there are always messages that we can send. Thanks for listening to our Broken Planet. We hope you've learned something along the way, and please don't despair. We all have an important role to play in helping to fix the problems in our world, and it starts with having conversations like the ones in this episode, as many as possible. If you found it helpful, then why not share this episode with friends and family? Let us know what you thought about this episode and join the conversation on social media using the hashtag OurBrokenPlanet. Or check out the bonus content and resources over on nhm.ac.uk slash podcast. Next week, in the words of Axel Rose, Welcome to the jungle! <laughs> yeah, that's right. We'll be grabbing our mosquito nets and taking to the tropics to explore the effects of deforestation. Our Broken Planet is presented by Tori Herridge and me, Khalil Thurloway. The producer was Artemis Irvin. The series producer is James Tyndale and the executive producer is Will Yates. Our Broken Planet is a Whistledown production for the Natural History Museum. <laughs>